Good morning. My name is Eric. I get to be one of the pastors here and want to say good morning to everyone watching online as well. We're so glad that you are joining us either now on Sunday morning or in the future if you're watching. So hello from the past. So again, we just want to say good morning. Uh, show me your note sheet. We want everyone to make sure you got one of these. If you don't, put your hands in the air. We'll get you one. Uh, because we believe we want to give you transforming truth. Not just some information, but give you a life of transformation. We need one down here for Aaron. Uh, and so if, we, if you can hear it, if you can see it, and then if you can write it down, that helps get those truths down deep into your heart, mind, and soul. We've been walking through the book of James, and we find ourselves now in James chapter 3. So if you have your actual physical Bibles... That's amazing. Open those to James 3. Otherwise, you can open up your phone, uh, on your app, go to James 3. Otherwise, today we have the slides up here behind me. But let's stand for the reading of God's word before we dive in today's message. James 3, 1 through 10. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, also able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large, they are driven by strong winds. They are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a force is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness, the tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers... These things ought not to be. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we get the opportunity to gather, to hear your word, to worship, to sing, to have community. God, we never want to take that for granted. God, thank you for your love and your grace. I pray you to be with everyone who's watching online, everyone who's in the room. God, right now that your spirit will begin to do the deep work that only you can do. You guide my words that everyone here would receive from you the message they need to hear. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, you can take a seat. The other day, I was performing in a rock concert with one of my childhood best friends, and it was amazing, and we were doing this great show. And then out of nowhere, Darth Vader showed up to shut down our show. And we're like, what is going on? But fortunately, Batman swooped in, to stop Darth Vader. Aren't dreams a wonderful, weird thing? Sometimes I wonder, like, what is the point of dreams? Have you ever thought about that? Like, why do we even have nightmares? Why do we have dreams? Have you ever thought about how weird they are, that you go to sleep and your mind puts together a strange story kind of depending on what you've watched or read or just maybe who knows where that came from. Last night, I dreamt all about guns. I don't know where that came from. My kids have been playing with guns around the house, so maybe that was it. I don't know. But it's so strange that when we sleep, our subconscious creates these stories. Well, the reason for that is that you and I have emotions that actually we're processing and grappling with. And emotions can't exist in a vacuum. And so... Your subconscious creates a story while you sleep to help you grapple with the things that you are trying to process. See, every emotion you and I feel needs some kind of story for it to attach to, some kind of story for it to exist. See, you and I, we are inherently storytellers. The history of humanity, you look back, we are a people who tell stories. You go back to the most ancient civilizations we can find, and they're telling stories on cave walls. We have stories written down that date back thousands of years ago. We need stories. We create stories. We are 
storytellers. But my question for you today is, what kind of story are you telling yourself about what story you find yourself in? And perhaps this morning, what you need to do is you're going to learn to flip the script. James, the half-brother of Jesus, he's going to talk about the power of the tongue, about the power of words. And today I want to look at the power of words that we tell ourselves and then the power that our words can have on others around us. And then, in fact, the power of our words with our vertical relationship towards God. Lives have been both elevated and cast down by the power of words. Nations have risen and nations have fallen by the power of words. I think of World War II. A man like Adolf Hitler, his words inspired his nation towards violence and prejudice and some of the worst atrocities that history has ever seen. And yet I think of then Winston Churchill inspiring his nation to resist, to resist tyranny and oppression. The power of words can make nations rise and fall. The tiny tongue is a mighty force. Never doubt the power of the tongue and never underestimate the power of words. Here's how James, the half-brother of Jesus, he says it in James 3, 6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Whoa, James, hell. He actually uses that same word for hell, Gehenna, that his half-brother Jesus used when he talked about hell. How many of you know that when Jesus used that word Gehenna, it was an actual place in Israel, not just a metaphorical place where little red devils with pitchforks were. Actually, it was. It was the garbage dump outside of Jerusalem. And this garbage dump was always on fire, where the worm did not die, where it was a place of stink and, and burning garbage and fire and filth. And so when Jesus talks about heaven, he's like, it's like the garbage dump outside the city, Gehenna. It's like this thing. That, I don't think that's an accurate portrayal of what hell is. We don't know exactly. But Jesus is saying it's like this. Just like the Holy Spirit is like a dove. And so James is using that same word. Our, tire, our tongue is set on fire by Gehenna, this garbage dump. To get into the Greek here, it's a present participle, which means, it's a fancy way of saying it, it's continuously set on fire by hell. Words have so much power. Words can create stories. I heard a speaker in Hollywood, and he was talking about the power of story and how there are certain characters that many of us subconsciously, perhaps, identify with. And so Hollywood stories, they often tell different stories for different characters. And in fact, a lot of these stories correspond to characters we find in the Bible because all truth is God's truth. Amen? And so today, when we talk about first the stories we tell ourselves, before we talk about how our words use others, I want you to know that the stories you believe about yourself don't just inform you, it actually forms you. How you see yourself, how you see the story that you live in, shapes and forms your identity and how you perceive the world around you, how you perceive yourself and how you perceive God. So you have to step back and say, hey, each one of us, we are writing a story. What kind of story are we writing? We look at the story of the Bible in Genesis. We started our church and we went through the book of Genesis. We said, God created us to have a relationship with him. We did a series called Relationship Rehab and said, well, actually, though, but our sin comes in and wrecks our relationship. Adam and Eve created in the perfection of the garden to be together forever. And, and what happens, though? Eve, she takes the apple, she takes a bite, she gives some to her husband, he takes a bite. They're filled with shame, and they're running. God shows up, and he asks, where are you? God knew where they were. But he's asking, where are you? And they come to him. And what does immediately Adam do? He plays that victim card, right? Hey, God, that woman that you gave me? It's like, what? That's pretty bold, Adam. He's pointing the finger at someone else. Like, here's the crazy thing. How many people are on earth at this time? Two. And yet, one is still blaming the other one, right? It's like, oh my word. And how much more do we have the same problem today? And I think many of us, we 
the story we are writing for ourselves is we look at ourselves like Adam, like the victim. Man, I can't believe that COVID happened to me and me alone. Oftentimes when you have a victim mentality, you think you're the only one going through that. You think you're the only one that, you know, you don't understand what it's like that my husband travels so much. You don't understand my parents and how they treated me. See, you don't understand. See, the victim thinks no one can truly understand what they've gone through. And they, they, they play that victim role. The second, I think some of us play the role of the martyr. Elijah was this great Old Testament prophet. What does he do? He faces the false prophets of Baal and, and fire falls down on the altar. It's this great story. And they kill 450 false prophets. But then the queen's like, I'm going to kill you, Elijah. So he's on the run and he's so depressed. He's like, God, I'm the only one that's still serving you. No one is quite like me, God. I'm the only one faithful to you. And God's like, uh, there's 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. All right. Like, don't get so full of yourself. Like, you got this. But I think some of us, again, we go through life, and, and not just the victim, we think of ourselves as the martyr. And we like to play that card of, sure, I'll do that for you, but man, it's so hard for me. And, and we kind of use some passive-aggressive talk, but we think of ourselves as the martyr. And, and we just think, man, I'm just suffering so much. I'm just always giving towards others, and, and you know, no one is quite like me. No one does quite what I do. Then I think there is people who identify as the innocent. This is Pilate. Pilate, the Roman governor, Jesus is presented to him and has every opportunity to say, hey, this man is innocent. I'm going to step in front and, hey, if you want to kill him, you have to come through me. But what does Pilate do? Pilate washes his hands. Hey. See, I think the person that identifies as the innocent is more concerned about not doing wrong than they are about doing right. Maybe some of you find this way. You're so obsessed with not sinning by doing wrong things that you've come complacent and aren't focused on doing some kind of right thing. Then there's the hero. And everyone's like, that's me, right? I'm the hero. Well, I think this is like Herod. Herod's actual son, who in the book of Acts, when the people are praising him, and he's like, yes, I am amazing. Look how wonderful I am. And what happens? He gets struck down dead by God. Because when you are the hero of the story, there's no room for God to be the hero. And so you falsely think, I'm amazing. Look what I've accomplished just for myself. But see, you got to flip the script. If you are the victim and you've been identified in your story by your pain, God wants you to flip that script and become a healer. That through the line of Adam, God promised, would become the suffering servant who would bring healing to the nations. And perhaps God wants you to stop telling yourself about how much pain you've gone through and then start saying, God, how can you redeem this pain to bring healing words towards others? See, how we talk about ourselves matters. Chris and I, we talk about this. We went through a season of three years of infertility. And it'd be so easy to still think, man, I'm a victim through this. Those are hard years. But now God wants to use that pain as a place of healing for others. Maybe you identify as the martyr, thinking, I'm the only one. No one is, is faithful, God. I'm the only one. But God wants to move from, from a martyr to a pioneer. Perhaps you are the first one in your family to follow Jesus, to, to walk with him. But what God wants you to do is say, hey, you're not just a martyr, you're a pioneer. You're blazing a new trail so that people coming behind you are going to follow in your footsteps to love and serve God. You are, are, are blazing a new trail. Maybe you're the innocent one. Maybe you're just so concerned about not doing bad things, but God wants you to flip that script from the innocent to the activist. And you might say, Eric, what do I do? What, what, what's the good thing to do? I think God's way less concerned about doing some, the, the right good thing than you just doing no good thing. Do something. Love your neighbor. Serve some kids. Foster some kids. Serve somewhere. Tell someone about Jesus. See, I don't think 
as you go and, and you're trying to do good and become an activist in this world and bring the kingdom of God, God's going to be like, you know what? You were supposed to bring the kingdom of God over here instead of here. I'm not very happy with you. No, I think he just wants us to get in the game. Some of us are so worried about doing the wrong thing. Hey, we seem to start trying to do something that's right. Amen? And perhaps you've been thinking of yourself as the hero in the story. What I encourage you to do is flip that script and think of yourself as the servant. See, Jesus, he is the hero, but he identified way more as the servant. The son of man came to seek, to save, to serve the lost. And when we start to identify ourselves, hey, I'm not the hero in this story. Hey, I'm just a servant. I'm here to serve my kids. I'm here to serve my spouse. I'm here to serve my neighbors. I'm here to serve my church. I'm here to serve those around me. And we can make Jesus the hero. What kind of story are you telling about yourself? Maybe one of those hit you this morning. Not only is the story we tell ourselves so important that the words we use towards others carry so much weight as well. In fact, they can influence the story that other people find themselves in. It's the power of the tongue. In junior high, junior high boys do weird things, right? I, I have a junior high son now. And he's great, but we do weird things in junior high. In junior high, I kept a frog tongue in my locker for weeks on end. Why? Because we were dissecting a frog, and it was dipped in formaldehyde, and so it was preserved. And I just thought, well, this frog tongue is pretty cool, so I'm going to keep this in my locker. Because, wow, look at a tongue. This is amazing. I thought that's about the most junior high boy thing I could think of. <laughs> but the power of the tongue, I was fascinated by the tongue. But see, our words do have so much meaning. The destructive power of the tongue. Think about gossip. Hey, hey, can, can you pray with me? Because, you know, so-and-so has done this, and, and, you know, I really want you to be praying for them. Hey, that's not yours to share. That's not your pain to carry. Sometimes we get so caught up in taking prayer walks with someone and sharing our pain with them that now they're carrying something they're never meant to carry when you should have taken that to God. There's destructive power in gossip and innuendo. And, and making jokes that just aren't good. And, 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 and making someone think about something that they shouldn't be thinking about. The power of criticism. Our words can cut people down. I tell my kids, anytime someone's sarcastic with you, there's always truth behind the sarcasm. Hey, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Well, there's always truth there, or you wouldn't have said it. Sarca sarcasm literally means eater of flesh. I'm not saying you don't have fun, don't have jokes, but be careful with your criticism. Because that can really affect someone and the story they're telling. Sarcasm. Go closely with that criticism. And you're eating someone's flesh. Just meanness. Bullying. Whether that's in person or online. Christians, we should not be known for being mean. Hey, it's fine to be political, but let's use respectful tones. I, I don't like it when any side makes fun of people's weight online because of a, of, of a politician or how they talk or whatever, fill in the blank. Let's not be mean, either side politically. Flattery. If gossip is saying something behind someone's back you wouldn't say to their face, flattery is saying something to someone's face you wouldn't say behind their back. It's saying kind words that seem good, but you don't actually mean them. You're just buttering someone up to get in good with them. These are all ways to not use the tongue. See, the reality is I've never met a man or woman who in their own power could tame the tongue. That's what James is saying. James 3, verse 7 and 8. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue, period. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. James, what are you saying then? <laughs> the destructive power of the tongue, no one can tame this. This is an, a, a force of hell. What, what, what do we do? James is driving us to grace. So the good news is you and I can't tame our words and our tongue, the stories we tell ourselves, the stories we tell others, the words we use towards God all by ourselves. But grace, grace says, hey, I'll help you with that. You can't tame this on your own, but grace says, I can. See, we must start first by asking God to purify our lips. 
In Isaiah 6, 5 through 7, Isaiah is his prophet, and he has this encounter with God. And he realizes how unclean his lips are. And here's what he says. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim, that's an angel, flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. That's the only way we can truly serve God by saying, God, I can't tame my tongues. I can't change the sarcasm. I come from a family that made bad jokes, that used meanness and criticism. God, I want to break this this generational curse in my life, but I can't do it on my own. And God says, yes, ask me to purify your lips. And then what happens? Verse 8, and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. See, the only way we can bring blessing with our words and life and, and goodness is by saying, God, I can't do this on my own. I'm not strong enough, God. Come purify my lips, and God will, in his infinite grace, purify your lips. And then you can say, here am I, God. Now use my words to make a difference. Now use my words to help people know they can live a better story. Number two, there must be ongoing prayer regarding our tongues. See, God will come in and touch and purify your lips. And I wish that was the end of the story. And you are made new when you come to Christ. But however, we're not perfect this side of heaven. And so sanctification is this ongoing process where we say, Holy Spirit, come in right now to me. I need you to continue to help me say words of life and truth and goodness because, God, I've fallen into that old trap of sarcasm. I've fallen into that old trap of criticism. I've fallen into that old trap of meanness. Again, this is why I urge and implore you, daily practice God's word, letting his word get in you. Spend time in prayer. Jesus Purify my lips. Help my words be words of good and truth. And it's an ongoing conversation. Now, also, you need to be ongoing in being vigilant of what are you bringing into your body and mind and soul. Amen? We had an old tape we listened to about a computer, a Christian computer. It must have been a MacBook. But input, output, that is what it's all about. Right, Mom? And it's so true. What are you reading? Who are you listening to? What are you watching? If you are listening to news programs that are all about getting you to continue watching so they can sell more advertising, right? I mean, all news, their goal is to sell advertising, not to inform you. Let's just be clear. And if you're listening to this and their words are cutting down people with different political views, you get so used to hearing that 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 word's come out of you now. You start watching a show. Hey, I love the show Ted Lasso, but I gotta be careful. There's a lot of language in that show. There's some good truths in it, but man, I gotta be careful. Otherwise, that kind of language can sneak into my mind and start to sneak out. So we gotta be careful. Hey, what's going in? What am I filling my mind with? We need to be, have this ongoing prayer, ongoing vigilance. And number three, we must resolve to discipline ourselves regarding the use of the tongue. Again, it's a partnership. God comes in, he purifies our lips. We can't do this alone, but also it's not abdication. It's saying, God, I'm going to partner with you. I'm going to discipline myself to to bring in the right words and to say, hey, I can grow in this. The tongue can have an awesome power for good. My friend Tony, I love Tony. Tony's a pastor in Iowa. Ethan got to meet him a couple weeks back. Tony is perhaps the most positive person I've ever met in my life who's so full of encouraging words. Like five minutes with Tony and your self-esteem goes skyrocket through the roof. Uh, We we met at at a food court. We're down there for a conference, and I hadn't seen Tony since before all of COVID. And I give him a big hug, and he comes, sits down, and he's sitting there, and we're eating our Chipotle, and he turns to Ethan, and he's like, 
You just met Ethan. Wow, that's so amazing, Ethan. You're down here, and, and you're with your uncle, and, and you're submitting yourself, and you're learning and growing. What an amazing opportunity. I think it's so cool that you're taking time out of your business schedule to be here. That shows so much about who you are, that you want to learn and grow and be the man that God's created you to be. And look at Eric. Wow, that's so cool that you get to be here with him. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, Eric's awesome. He's a pastor. He loves people, and he cares for people, and he's so great that you are here with him. And wow, that's so cool. And we're both like, this is amazing. And Tony, that's just who he is nonstop. Some people think he's fake. That's just who he is all the time. Now, most of us, other than maybe Josh Olson, aren't wired up that way naturally. (laughs) But here's the thing. All of us can grow in that, right? What if we all said, hey, I want to grow in this. I want to be more like Tony. I want to speak words of truth. What if that we took as much time and attention that we normally would spend in picking out a birthday present for someone that we love to say, hey, you know what? I'm grabbing lunch with this friend. I'm grabbing coffee. I'm going to be on the setup team with this person. God, help me to think through how can I encourage them? Everyone has strengths. What if we, we, we spent some time and just said, Jimmy, that's amazing that you're here and you're helping set up. And you know what? You cook some amazing carne asada. And that is so awesome how when I went to small group one time, Jimmy, and you were there and you cooked up some amazing steak and you fed all the small group. And that was so cool. And we were able to be filled up with good food so we could have a good conversation. That was because you grilled up that steak. And that was amazing. Like we can all grow in this, right? Because our words have power. The tongue can be used for good. It can be used to proclaim the life-changing message of salvation. Here's how the Apostle Paul writes it in Romans 10. For everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Now, you may never preach a sermon on stage, but we've all been sent. We are the sent ones, and our words can actually change someone's eternal destiny. See, God gives us all the choice to say, hey, do you want an eternity with me, with everything that is good and true and worthy and light and love? Or do you want nothing to do with me and an attorney apart from all that is good and true and right and holy. See, everyone gets the choice to say to God, thy will be done. Or God will say to you, okay, you want nothing to do with me, thy will be done forever. You can be separate from all that is good and true and holy and right. Separated from love. And we, with our words, have the opportunity to say, hey, you, friend, can know the salvation of God. You can be forgiven from the shame and guilt that you found. You can break those generational curses of alcoholism, of verbal abuse, of cutting language and sarcasm. You don't have to be like your parents just because their blood flows through your veins. You can be different. And with our words, we can proclaim salvation. We can offer the good news With our words, we can pray for healing. Someone whose heart is broken. We can use our words for good. And instead of just saying, hey, I'll pray for you, say, hey, can we stop right now? Can I just pray for you right now? As hard as that is. Our words can also bring worship to God. Our tongues can be used for these horrible things, but also God has given us the ability to, on our own and in community, to sing to God. I'm just always, and I, I nerd out about this stuff, so if this is like, you think this is lame, that's fine. Just, just, you know, ignore me for like the next 30 seconds. But I just think it's so cool that like there are frequencies and, and, and how we resonate and like the whole universe, all stars vibrate at different frequencies and, and, and all this is going on around us at all times. But you know what happens when we sing these words? Our frequencies and vibrations attune to the same wavelengths. And now together, as we sing together, as the band leads us, like we are unified and attuned. And it's amazing. Like 
I just, it blows my mind. That's so cool that we get to do this. Like, we're all literally vibrating at the same frequencies. How cool is that that our throats, like, amazing. And we get to do this and direct our praises up to God. You never know. You singing loudly, Psalm says, make a joyful noise. You don't have to be the best singer. But your voice could be the encouragement that someone sitting next to you needs that you don't even know it. That as you sing your praises to God, as the band is playing and you are, are praying in your own words, as you're lifting up your, if you speak in tongues, your spiritual gift of speaking in tongues, you don't know how that could encourage someone around you. That as you praise God, as you lift up his name, people are encouraged around you. I shared this story a couple weeks back, how I was on the airplane flying home and this woman next to me didn't know her, super scared to fly and she grabs my hand. Chris is behind me, and her husband's next to her, and she's like, can you pray with me? And as the plane gets to take off, I'm praying with her. And then she's like, just, can you, because she knows a pastor, just, just like preach at me. Just preach me like words of truth. And so I'm like, oh man, I wish I had more scriptures to memorize. But like the ones that I do, I'm just quoting those scriptures at her. And I, I'm, I'm speaking truth, and I'm remembering, okay, what sermons have I preached on peace? Okay, here we go. Let's get the big points to her. And, and, and your words can make a difference to a stranger you've never met before. I don't know. She lives up in the Iron Range. I don't know what her story is, but you know what? My words are the plant seeds and truth. Our words can have an eternal impact. So what words are you using towards God and towards others and yourself? Perhaps you know you need to flip the script. The only way to do that is to ask God to help you flip that script. Perhaps you have been feeling like a victim. Perhaps you identified more through your, about your pain than through your purpose. And God wants to help you flip that script and say, hey, yes, your pain is real, but now to acknowledge your scars are evidence that God heals, amen? And so now use your words for healing. Perhaps you've been a martyr. Maybe you've reveled in the fact, you know, I'm the only one who really, truly serves God. I'm the only one who gets up early. I'm the only one who makes breakfast for my family. I'm the only one who puts the dishes away in the dishwasher. You know, you've been identifying as that martyr. Instead, God wants you to identify as a pioneer. Hey, I'm just blazing the trail. I'm teaching my kids to put their dishes in the dishwasher. I'm teaching my kids what it means to get up early and to be in God's word. Hey, I'm teaching my neighbors what it is to be a good neighbor to, to show love to others. Hey, I'm blazing the trail. I'm leaving behind the, the unhealthy habits and behaviors of my parents and my family of origin, and now I'm blazing a new trail of, of goodness and life and love. Perhaps you've been so concerned that, hey, I'm just an innocent person. You've been so concerned about not doing anything wrong that you haven't done anything right in a long time. And God says, hey, stop identifying just as an innocent person. Be an activist. Do something. Something good is always better than nothing good. Do something. And I, I firmly believe God directs our steps, but it's really hard to direct someone's steps when they're just standing still. Take that first step. God will then say, hey, over here, over here, come over here. Do this, do this. And as we step into just wanting to do something for God, God will direct our paths. Worst case scenario, you've done something really, really good for someone else that you weren't supposed to, <laughs> okay? Like, that's a good thing for still, right? And then instead of thinking of yourself as the hero of your story, that the story revolves around you, hey, I'm a servant. I'm like Jesus. Jesus is the hero. Jesus is the star in the play. Jesus is the starting pitcher. We're just backing him up on the baseball team. I'm a servant. I'm a servant. I'm a servant. That's how we need to flip that script. Imagine if we all took this time to really focus on the power of our words. Imagine as a community how different that would be if we wanted to be more like Tony. And we showed up at small group and, and you've been thinking throughout the day, all right, how am I going to show up and, and how am I going to encourage Aaron? Okay, what am I going to do? What, what words can I say? Aaron, I think it's so amazing that you came last Thursday night and you brought your boys and, and your daughter and you're hanging out and, and you're investing in your kids and what a great dad you are and I love how involved you are and man, you are amazing and Aaron, I want to be more like you. Imagine if we all had that, where we, we were intentional about our words and speaking truth into others. Imagine if we flipped the script and said, hey, I'm here to be a servant. 
I'm here to be a healer. I'm here to be an activist. I'm here to be a pioneer, to blaze a new trail. And imagine if we truly understood the power of our words that we get to speak to the creator of the universe, to talk to him, to praise him, to lift up his name. And I firmly believe as a community, as we grow in prayer and worship, and as we grow in our ability to connect with God through our words and through our tongue, that will inspire those around us. That God will use our words to make a difference. As we close, I just want to read this kid's book. And this is a book Becca has, and I think it's just so beautiful. It says, Words and Your Heart. This book is about your heart, that little bit inside of you that makes you, you. Will you listen very carefully? Because it's really important. And it might help you be a happier you. And the people around you be a happier them. You see, the words that go into your ears can actually affect your heart. That little bit inside of you that makes you, you. Your words can do amazing things. They can describe things that are big or if they're little. They can explain stuff so that you can understand it goes whiz, whoosh, boo. Or spin, tinkle, ping. Words can make you happy and make you want to sing. But sometimes words can make us cry. We all know what sort of words those are. You see, sometimes words can be like a deadly arrow that can pierce someone's heart, that little bit inside of them that makes them them. Some words can really hurt. Words have power. Dun, dun, da. Your words can actually change the way someone's heart feels. That little bit inside of them that makes them, them. If someone feels sad, your words can cheer them up. If someone feels weak, your words can help them feel stronger. If someone wants to give up, your words can help them keep going. Your words can make them giggle, make them grin, make them laugh out loud and roll around. Do you get it? Your words are amazing and powerful. How about we use our words to look after each other's hearts, the little bit inside of us that makes us us. Let's try it together and see the difference it makes. Today, somebody's world can be a better place because of you. Thank you. Doesn't that make your heart feel good? I love that. Our words have the power to change how someone feels how their heart is, whether it's encouraged and excited or sad and lonely. Let's commit to using our words to flip the script on our own lives, to bring blessing and grace to others and use our words to acknowledge God and to praise him. Let's pray and then we're gonna receive our offering. God, thank you that you The word made flesh came and dwelled among us. You lived the perfect spotless life showing us who God was. And then you went to the cross taking all our sin and guilt and shame. And then three days later you rose again as the forerunner for all of us who will be raised to new life. So God, we thank you for that. So right now I pray that these words of James would just go down deep into us, that we would take his warning seriously. God, that we would reject careless words. Words of gossip and criticism and complaining and meanness and flattery. And instead, God, we would see the power of our words and how we talk to ourselves, how we talk to others, and how we address you, God. So, God, we, we say, yes, we will use our words for good, but we can't do it on our own strength. So, God, I pray right now you would come with your spirit and you would touch our unclean lips. 
you would change us. And daily, God, you would help us to discipline ourselves, to use our words for good, that we'd look for opportunities to be a blessing with our words. In your name we pray, amen. We're gonna see our offer now. Uh, you can put that, that.